inform tourism policy on, on the grand arena of policy making when it comes to the Arctic and the Antarctic. And also related to that, we can think about the geopolitical stance of tourism. I mean, what is its role in the larger geopolitical issues that are surrounding the Arctic and the Antarctic? So this, that's, a, these are, that's an area I would love to explore. And another area that I would love to explore is, uh, is you know, how, how tourism, which is, it's being touched upon always, but I never see it framed in that way, uh, through the post-colonial challenges that we deal with in the Arctic, as of course in the Arctic mainly, uh, when it comes to that, uh, because it, it's so problematic, some of the issues that we deal with. Like, for instance, Dimitri, we talk about Greenland, and I mean, Danish researchers in Greenland. Yeah. You know, and, the, and there are all kinds of issues like that. I mean, it, uh, and, and all over the place uh, when it comes to, and then, then when we come to North America, and we have the First Nations in Sakti and other places. So, and I think we, we can do well in starting framing where tourism and what tourism is doing there. Uh, we've touched upon it, but tourism in the end of the day is a business. Tourism in the end of the day is about commercializing things, yeah. right? So what, what happens there? So uh, that's the two sort of uh, agenda items that I think we have plenty of fertile ground to to plant our seeds into, if you like. Yeah, one key metaphor there. That's a good point. Uh, be before I go, there's a question from the back there. Before I go to that, um, just to respond a little bit to what you were saying. I've always been thinking, you know, sometimes if you say, you know, polar tourism research, and you kind of put tourism at the front, but is it about tourism, or is it actually, especially in the northern hemisphere, okay, maybe not so much with Antarctica, but is it about tourism, or is it about basically um, making uh, communities more thriving, so they don't lose population, so basically people are employed, so the youngsters have something to do, uh, is it about that? And so the question is, tourism could be one of many economic diversification tools. We, it's an easy one sometimes, but one that problematic also because I think we misunderstand it as I was saying in my presentation before. So the question though is should it always be tourism and should we also think about kind of what about places where tourism might not work or um, maybe, the, maybe the local people actually don't want tourism because we don't really ever ask them, uh, local people, you know, you, you know we kind of, it's almost imposed many of them very often. So, or maybe they want tourism, but they want a certain type of tourism. So, you know, I, I think we, we have to think critically about this. Um, but that's just a comment responding to what you said. But you, you had a, a question. Yeah, I just have a like, uh, quick comment about that language thing and the discussion. So, um, all the Finnish tourism from hello from Finland. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I could speak Finnish here, yeah, nobody would probably understand. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, if not, the, the, if not the, the question is about which language are we talking about in these conferences, but I would still like to see more publications in different languages, even if it's the same article but translated in different languages, because the situation like in Finland is right now that every, every tourism researcher who wants to be known inside, outside of the, the municipality borders have to write the, all the articles in English, and, and we have less and less academic stuff printed in Finnish language, which is not good for the language either, so because and, and for students either, so, so the community. So I would still like to keep that the language thing somehow alive and to see if whether there would be possibility for the network, for instance, publish something in Russian language or Swedish or some of the indigenous languages that people actually study in the That's a good point you make. Um, I know that um, Alan Liu, um, who runs tourism geography, is what he has been doing over the last few years because of his associations in Asia, um, he has had at least the, um, the abstracts written in like Asiatic languages and then I think now he has basically a Chinese version of tourism geographies coming out. Mm -hmm. So it is possible this day and age, if you find people in other countries to kind of act as co-editors and things, it's, it, it's easier than it ever has been before because of the electronic media, you find somebody who can translate properly, it can be done. Um, and I think we're at a much better stage now than we were a decade ago to do that. Um, but of course, it's easier to do it with a big market like the Chinese market, with this huge demand. Finnish might be a little bit of an obstacle because you'd have to find it's, it's a small market, same with Swedish, I think. I think you know, but some of the French, of course, you know, and uh, yeah, that would be a beginning. 
Mr. Jack, um, this conversation is, is so important because I think there's a, a danger that we become very comfortable in our network. Mm -hmm. Ten years for our, um, we need to constantly reflect and ask ourselves who's missing. I've been already identified. Mm -hmm. Critical, critical region that's you know has, has struggled to participate in this. Um, we see the rise from a geo geopolitical point of view, um, the Asian interest in the polar regions. Mm -hmm. um, they're new players. There's a whole new set of values that go with that. Um, how do we how do we embrace? And also, how do we get genuine engagement with our decision makers, um, our policy makers, um, organizations like the IPTRN, uh, IATO, um, they were at the IPTRN um, in, in Christchurch. But where are these groups? Um, the movers, shakers. Um, we're in, we can't be um, removed from that. And, and that's where I would comment that we are in our next 10 year phase, and I'll say thriving in our next 10 years, um, is, is how we engage with those other organizations. And, and I can see that on a lot of different scopes. One of them is how do we engage with the industry organizations like IATO or, or AECO? Um, how do we engage with you know larger organizations that may have the resources and the supports to allow us to do translation and things like that and you know connected to the IPTRN is almost a, a sister network within the University of the Arctic that does have some of those supports and and Russian members and things like that that can help us uh, engage so we don't have to do everything alone that's the that's the key message I think I think it's important to, to, to look at uh, I mean the impact that we do, that we make and, and uh, I, I learned today I mean that Nayato uh, is talking about or that the uh, Arctic Treaty is, uh, states are talking about tourism but at the same time I realized that uh, the Norwegian University Center at Svalbard disregard any anything that has with humans to deals with humans and they made the decision only recently and uh, so, so I think there are there are struggles ahead and, and I think I mean I thought of that when Dimitri was presenting I mean uh, I mean tourism is cheap it's it's a cheap thing to produce actually and it's it's kind of always it's for politicians very easy to say oh let's do some tourism and then spend some money you don't have to spend a lot of money for doing for creating a tourism job actually so it's kind of a lot of, of, of talk in a way and a little action and, and uh, and, and I think, from that point of view, it's really um, kind of important to 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 to, to go also the political way and, and kind of the science political way. And that leads me to the other thing that I thought of a little bit, referring back to the language discussion once again. I think we have to also think about what is the primary objective of research. And, and I think today, and and we cannot free ourselves from that. I think today many of us are kind of measured according to bibliometrics and production kind of ideas uh, that, that cannot be disregarded. If we disregard it, then, then we are away. That's, it's that easy. So, so in a way I think we have to, to, to go um, yeah, in, in, two, in two directions in a way. I think uh, there is this one thing that we should do and that is contribute to the global body of knowledge. And that actually independent of local communities, and and uh, and it's kind of what we should do is kind of engage in a scholarly discussion about it. But I think the the, the, the fallacy that is I think can be noticed in, in a lot of contexts nowadays is that we satis get satisfied with only doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think that is that is a real danger. I think we should always think of that we're doing this still for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And there is kind of a higher value in doing this, and that is making the world a better place in the end. And therefore, we should also talk about what we're producing. Yeah. And therefore, I think, uh, you know, I mean, if we're talking about, if I, if I would write a science article in Swedish, nobody would read it. Nobody would really read it. But if I would write a popular, a popular article, that actually, yeah, that actually uh, kind of cares for the people uh, who, whom I probably write that for, 
and the people who have a use of it. I think that is a, a, a better strategy. So I, I don't think that, I mean, what we write in science is often too specialized. And, and I mean, we meet to, to kind of, to discuss very particular problems sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that are not necessarily the answer to the question that is uh, asked in the Greenlandic case. I mean, there are a lot of things that can be applied. It's actually already known. We know that. It's not a question of new research. It's something, it's more about applying knowledge that we have. And, and, but I think that is something not to be disregarded. And therefore, I think it's important to speak to the people. You know, and also in order to, to recreate trust in science and the abilities of science, particularly in a time like this, where, where we kind of see uh, fake news and uh, alternative facts and yeah. so on and so on. So it's important that we do both and yes. that we, and we yes. critically engage yes. with both. Exactly. And use that, that is a challenge nowadays. There was a comment or question for me? Well, more a comment, but I, I think in that sense, and with what Patrick and, and Dieter are saying, um, one objective we could have for the future is to say, okay, we've created a lot of knowledge um, some presentation today, including mine, show a lot of impacts that we documented already like 20, 25 years ago. They're still happening today. So problem one, how do we move from our research to making the management people, including government, they look, we know about these things, you keep repeating the same thing. I cannot continue to do research on impacts. <laughs> we know already the tools and the solution. Why are they still happening? So then it brings to the second issue, how to communicate that information to the general public, including the tourists and the manager. So maybe the network could have as an objective to say, we're going to focus, let's say, on, on, on 10 papers over the next uh, three years on specific issue that we write as a group. And once we, we might spend one year, two years on the paper, and once it's agreed, once the content is, is well developed, then we translate that into five main languages, French, Russian, and so on. And we make sure that politicians and managers get access to them. And on the website, they become documents of references. And then maybe we have the language connection and the transfer of knowledge to the public. Uh, yeah, might just a comment or a perhaps next step maybe for this, um, thinking about language and expanding networks. Um, what about webinars? Um, as a first step, webinars, yeah, so perhaps have a, an existing number, like an online um, presentation. Online presentation. Yeah. yeah, perhaps having a member that's here already uh, that's a representative of their language and actually start building the network that uh, way online the, first. Yeah, to the start. Atlas network does that quite often. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that, that's Just a, certainly yeah. something to think about. And what's great here is that it will like the, the comments and the, and the what we should do next. We've got little seeds of having done them. I think, you know, the testimonials that we get out of over here in front of the large map can become the start of some little video presence online. And the Arctic Observation Systems article that the steering committee wrote two or three years ago uh, is a good example. And it was specifically written as a collective and published in an uh, open access journal. Yeah. And then even the last conference that the proceedings, we've had books, but books are very much, unless your library subscribes to this Springer book or that. So we, we had an open access journal. And so I think the step, the, the first steps are there. So now it's you know taking the plunge to have that open access journal and then say, and we want to make it translated into these. So we've come part way, let's go all the way. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, now I'm speaking as somebody who has nothing to do with tourism and uh, still uh, here at the conference. And actually, I'm. I must admit that I'm very positively surprised at a lot of the discussions uh, you, I've been following today and also yesterday and also the program how it's set up. I think it's uh, speaking a lot to me because it uh, is very obvious that you are sharing a sort of <coughs> commitment. Uh, that I would say the psychology that I'm working with is also sharing, uh, which actually is a, to some extent very explicitly political commitment, uh, which is actually this commitment of, of uh, trying to exactly value in a way the local value everyday life, how, how, how basically everyday life lived, and integrate that, make that part of your research commitment, right? 
Uh, that's at least how I read it, and I think uh, it's interesting because you said earlier also in some of the presentations that, that you don't want to take a normative stance, but I think normativity per se is not the problem, uh, because if the normativity actually implies that one opens up for democratic processes and makes those part of basically publishing and making uh, part of the also uh, political discussions, uh, policy discussions, and so forth. I think that is something to actually, in a way, put on the map very explicitly. I think that's also what we are trying, from, for instance, to do with our social psychology. Um, but of course, there is sort of this problem when talking science politics. Uh, then that that the whole question of how impact, for instance, is measured, it's bibliometrical impact. And I think there's also a, a task sort of in, in, in uh, working within the community, I guess, of tourism research also. I don't know how explicitly that's done or not, but to also change, try to push towards changing notions of impact only being measured in terms of bibliometrical impact. The problem is that all other forms of impact, societal impact, are difficult to measure, yeah. right? But I think it's, I mean, there's many discussions going into sort of an understanding of having to make